What up? It's Leeds. Back again. All right. I'll type this in here. What we are doing today. Interview with Cam Meekins. Fellow Massachusetts. I believe West Coast transplant. We'll see. We'll talk where he is these days. See people piling in. That's good. A bunch of names I cannot pronounce again. Yuta Hoshi Paki joined. That's good. Dio, what up? What else we got here? Oh, got to pin this thing. Yeah. All right. There we go. We're good. Dio, what's going on? One love, Tiff. What up? These names, man. <laughs> it's tough. Feel free to type something in if you want me to shout it out. Rushmore Music, what up? Hanzo Blades, what up? Peace, 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 Hanzo. Peace 76. Binor, what up? Noir. Grant Grime Wave, what up? We're just, uh, this is my sound check <clears throat> part of the interview where we just get warmed up here, wait for Cam to show up. Windy today in Boston. Sun's starting to come out. What we got here? We got Mall Grits in the building. Kid Savage, what up? Yeah. <clears throat> Cam Meekins has joined. I guess we can start early today. He's on time. Send me a request, Cam. Here we go. Here we go. Right into it. I love it. Wait, wait. What up? There he is. There you are. On, How are you? I'm good. Let me get this uh, yeah. volume up as high as I can here. It's always the, the thing, you know, like move the phone, hold on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was all set up and then it then it did the split screen, so I was like, all right, well, I got to yeah. I got to adjust. So what the hell's up, man? Where you been? Where, are you uh, are you in California or out back out here? I always forget. Yeah, I'm in I'm in LA. Uh nice. I've been out here for like 3 years now. Oh, wow. Right. Uh, I know I you were out Boston. there, but I don't know if you came back. I know there was like I thought you came back, but I wasn't sure. Dude, I've I've jumped around like five times. I was I was out here initially with Maddie. Yep. And then I came back. Well, well, he stayed, and I came back. Then I moved to New York for a little bit. Then I came back uh, to LA, and I've been here for three years. And uh, I'm liking the vibe out here these days, man. You like what? I'm liking the vibe out here these uh, days. The first really, time I, I heard I heard LA's. Coming. I was talking to Teddy. Teddy said that LA's getting a little little nuts down. It's shutting everything down, and people are moving yeah, out of there. There's definitely a lot of. Uh, a lot of issues in terms of the, the infrastructure of, of the state. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of this balance of the vibe of LA and the geography and the beauty of it is great, but the actual benefits that you get from the state aren't really there, you know, right. and then you're paying 13% tax, but you're not really feeling like you get that. So there's a lot of people that are frustrated. Right. You know? And I would imagine rent's pretty high in LA. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I think it's it's one of those things where right now it's like if you're paying rent to live inside the city limits, you're not getting the city benefit. You know what right. I'm saying? Because everything's shut down, which I don't disagree with. I think that, you know, things should be shut down to, to get the virus under control. But, you know, it's hard to justify paying a premium in rent to live in a city when you can't use the resources of the city. You can't go and go out and go to the restaurants and go to a club and come back, you know, that's the benefit of living close to the city is being able to jump around and do all those things that the city has to offer. So yep. when that's not an option, it's like, well, fuck, why am I, why am I doing that? I can go 30 minutes farther out, save some money, you know? Yeah. I mean, we're kind of doing, I'm, I'm kind of faced with the same thing here in Boston. I kind of feel the same way about it. 
Um, you know, Boston is ex very expensive and I don't even use anything in the city, you know, and I'm, I'm crammed in, in a condo with all these other, you know what I mean? All these other people. And it's just, yeah. I don't really, it, I think it might be time for me to move. Actually, I know it's time for me to move. Yeah, I hear that, man. I hear that. And I'll stay in Massachusetts, though. For sure, for sure. <laughs> I just, I just feel, but I'm thinking the same thing and I haven't done the move yet, but I'm just thinking like, you know, it's not that bad to spend an extra 30 minutes in the car, you know? Yeah throw on some music, just take some phone calls and just do the commute, you know? Yeah, my stepdad used to drive like an hour and a half to, to cause we grew up in Southern New Hampshire. He'd drive like an hour and a half into, into Boston just to go to work. So it'd be like a yeah. three hour round trip sometimes. I was like, so like 30 minutes, that's like nothing. <laughs> I mean, exactly, exactly. It's, it's crazy. But I appreciate you coming through and giving me a time and, and doing this. We've known each other for a good 10 years, like 10, 10 yeah. plus years. Yeah. And I was thinking about it when you when you brought up the anniversary of the 1993 album. I think that is when we kind of started working together, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's exactly right, yeah. Right. So I'm trying to think. The first show we did, and I know you've mentioned it on tracks, was that show. I think it was like opening up for, for Sean for at Sean, the Western Front. Western Front, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you're really cool about it because, you know, it, it wasn't really your crowd. And you were just kind of like, you know, you were just trying to get things rolling. And you were really cool. And then, and then we did the uh, – and, 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 you know, then we did the uh, Chris Webby show and then it was like, all right, this is this, this is more of the scene. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. And uh, but, you know, I want to talk about that, that era there. And because, uh, you know, that era was a big change in the Boston music scene um, from what I had came up in, you know, um, real underground scene. And then I think, you know, with the with the with, with Sammy Adams hitting the scene, it became this new wave of hip hop. Um, that kind of riffled through Boston, you know, some labeled it frat rap, which I know a lot of people say is a negative thing, but that word got used and you kind of got thrown in there. <laughs> thrown I think your boy there. created that word too. Your boy, Peter wasn't Parker. my boy. We won't talk about who owns the frat rap Tumblr. I won't expose the identity of the frat rap Tumblr. I think you <laughs> might know. I know it's not my boy, boy. we're friends, but it's not my best friend, yeah, uh, yeah. Peter Parker. He did make the, uh, uh, the frat rap mixtape, I believe. <laughs> That's but um, yeah, so I mean, wh wh let me know your thoughts on like, what was it like during that time for you? And what were your thoughts about the whole thing? 100%. I mean, that was a real moment in time. And I think, uh, when I think back at that, and, and really, I think about a lot about, you know, the, the business that you and I did back, you mm -hmm. know, back then, because I think that was still you know, it was, to your point, it was a new genre and a new kind of era for Boston music, because prior mm -hmm. to that, I think it was a lot more underground, a lot more, um, you know, real lyricism, which I loved. And I grew up like listening to that music and especially even some of the more underground Boston stuff. I thought that was super amazing. And then I think Sammy and Chris Webby and guys like that started paving the way for this kind of new subgenre of hip hop that was, you know, um, kind of just a new sound a little bit more poppy and you know something that college kids were getting behind so i think that's why people said oh it's frat rap frat rap because that right. was the type of kid that wanted to listen to that shit and right. you know party and put on a sammy adams song and have a good time and you know that's that's all that's all great but i talk about this a lot now because that was although it was a new era that was still the time where doing shows from the ground up was really important to build your following. And nowadays it's so much more online based, which is great because it kind of democratizes the whole thing and anybody can become successful if they get, you know, something to pop off on TikTok or Instagram and they just show their creativity and they succeed like that. That's the whole new thing now. But back then it was brick by brick in terms of I had to reach out to you and say, hey, man, take a chance on me. I'm 16, 17 years old. Let, yep. me, let me open. I'll sell tickets. You know, I'll, I'll figure out what I need to do to get on that bill because I just want the exposure. I want right. to, you know, get an opportunity to be in front of people and just rap and, and learn how to be on stage over years and years of kind of doing that slowly but surely. And, you know, I, I reminisce on that because I think that was an amazing thing. And our life is so much more social media based now than it was back then, even though that stuff was starting to really make a big difference. And me and Sammy and Chris Webby 
were the first kind of guys in the Northeast that were starting to really use Facebook and social media to like build our following. And so it was this hybrid of the old method of like doing shows and building your fan base geographically in the city that you live in and then growing from there and then also using online. And now it's only online. People only think about how do I just get popping online and then the show stuff comes after. Um, but, you know, I think there's something to be said to building that uh, repertoire of doing shows early on in your career because you learn how to perform. When I started doing shows with you in Boston, that's how I learned how to perfect my craft from the live show standpoint. I knew what to do in the studio because I'd been doing that for a couple of years. And then I started linking with Maddie and he mm -hmm. really kind of paved the way in the studio, but I didn't know how that correlated to live music. And so I think a lot of times now, and you probably see it as a guy running shows, you know, people might be incredibly famous and have never even done a show before. You know, and so it's yeah. interesting how that shift has happened. But I think back on that time period, I think it was just an incredible era for this new subgenre of music that kind of came out of nowhere. And it was really mm -hmm. um, fun to be a part of, you know, and I can tell that story of how I got my foot in the door, because for me, I was really like, as you probably know, I was just trying to just knock down doors whatever way I could and just get yeah. connected with people. And the reason that Maddie even gave me a shot is because I was kind of just hitting him up a ton of times because I saw that he worked with Sammy and I was just trying to backdoor my way into what I saw was this group of people that was doing something cool between you, yeah. Maddie, you know, Sam's team, Chris Webby, all these guys. I was just trying to figure out how can I be a part of this, this big kind of thing that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you talk about, uh, did Maddie produce, we're talking about Maddie Harris here for those that don't know. Yeah. Uh, did he produce the whole 1993 uh, album? He executive produced it and mixed the whole thing. And then he had like four of the songs on there that were actually produced yeah. by him. And, you know, most of that tape was recorded at Soundclash Studios. My, well, oh, really? That was my, my studio? or Yeah, your studio. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so, I don't even remember. I forgot yeah, exactly. I owned the studio. <laughs> That's what, you know, the whole timeline of it was like, I reached out to you because I'd heard about you through Maddie. Right. And I reached out to Maddie maybe a month before that because I saw that he was working with Sammy. And I was like, right. dude, I make music. Let's get in the studio together and make right. some music. So we started making some music together at Cyber Sound Studio in Boston. He told me, Leeds is my friend. He's he's the guy in hip hop in Boston. Yep. If you if you want to do music in Boston, you gotta connect with this dude. And so Thanks, Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh I reached out to you and you said, you know, I think on my side, I feel like it was like, I, I had to show that I was, you know, yeah. down to do it. And you said, all right, I'm gonna put you on this Fashawn show <laughs> at the Western Front. And I was like, all right, let's do it. At the time, Fashawn was like freshman, um, what was it, the top 10 there? He was like up and coming. It was um, yeah. the beginning of the blog era, I think as well. Right. Um, the blog era. And he was hot on the blogs. And, you know, there was a lot of, hype behind him in the beginning so and, and what and i didn't really know your style 110 percent. so when open an axe would hit me up i'd just be like this is what i got do you want to right. do it and they would be like word i'll do it so and but then over the years i figured once i learned what their style was it changed um so that, that's kind of how that ha that happened but uh, for those that don't know western front is like a two floor <laughs> It was a two floor uh, venue that place. felt like you were rapping in someone's living room, but it was, it was it held some of the most legendary, it had some legendary shows in there, uh, even before okay. I started doing shows. So it was, it was a historic thing, but that was kind of on the way out. And I think about 2011, do you think that the sound of, you know, Webby and Sammy and you and, you know, a lot of others that followed after, do you think that was more sing based with the choruses like because i think that was like the big jump was it's like all of a sudden singing was really up front in the choruses which we had just gone through a decade of like no singing <laughs> in hip-hop and right. then it was like oh we're making we're throwing this these melodies in there and then i remember everybody was singing like even if you couldn't sing you were singing and i think you've been seeing that still today but right. um right so like, and, and then also for those that don't know that Maddie was actually, Maddie was working with Sam Adams, actually engineered the whole album, right? And then produced many tracks. And then you guys kind of formed a, a partnership after that, right? Like yeah. you kind of did, you guys 
went to he went to California, and then you ended up getting a uh, single deal with a major label. Is that what it was? A single deal, or was it? A... No, it was a whole record deal, but it was kind of like a development deal. So there was mm. like a mixtape phase, then albums, and everything like that. And so, um, I, I really think what drove the the style of that music was, at least for me, and I think this is probably the case for everybody. If you think back two thousand nine, two thousand ten. The biggest artists were Drake and Wiz Khalifa and yep. Lil Wayne too. And yep. what made them stand out at that time period was the auto-tune shit. Right. And the fact that Drake was doing this melodic rap that was very new. And Wiz Khalifa was also doing melodic rap in a way too that was a little bit more, you know, focused on kind of stacked vocals and stuff like that. But so there was this trend going on in hip hop where melodic rap and bigger singing hooks was becoming more of a thing even from the biggest guys like drake and Wiz Khalifa who were coming right. out and then yep. wayne was doing his thing with the auto-tune and right. no ceilings came out and everybody was trying to use auto-tune to rap and so i think just just because that technology was a thing artists like me and sammy and and all these guys who started to uh make music around then gravitated towards well let's try and make some catchy hooks and use the auto tune to sing a little bit and, yeah. you know, create that kind of sound. And so I think it, it branched off of what was already starting to happen in, in more general hip hop. And then this right. subgenre kind of took that and became a very melodic genre that was focused on big hooks. And, and then, you know, the verses were heavy on the rap side too. Right. And so, for me, I tried to find my lane because I know that I can sing stuff melodically um, and do it in a way that, you know, kind of feels cool, but I'm not necessarily the best singer in the world, but I can just hit the notes and make it sound good. Right. But I knew that my advantage was actually on the lyric side too, with, with actually writing verses. And right. so trying to find that balance of, you know, making something that people want to listen to and they, they can party to or they can just like throw on in their car but then if you if you want to take a deeper dive into the lyrics that's there too you right know? And so i always tried to put myself out there in that way and you know perfect my craft from the verses too because i think they were both super important yeah because you were pretty adamant i remember in the beginning like when when people were starting to pigeonhole it a little bit you were right. like, nah, man, that, <laughs> I'm not all this way. I can rap. Right. And you were like, you set your boundaries. And, and we, we did a bunch of tracks together. You know, you, you, you made it clear that I can rap. You know, this isn't just some pop music. I'm not here for the fad. I'm here. I'm, I love hip hop music. I'm, I'm in it all the way. I can sing. I can do these type of records. But I can do some lyrical stuff. And you've really done a really good job of balancing that. I, I thought, especially yeah. during that time period. Or it was really getting <laughs> extremely pigeonholed. And, right, um, right. And I think also people got like a lot of the people that were coming up in the Boston scene, they just got upset because how quickly that style was taking off. And these guys had been digging in the trenches for 10 years and they were like, well, what the heck? And, and the shit kind of just, and Sammy just came out of nowhere. And, yeah. and, and I get why it worked, you know, the, in everything, but it was just like, Hip hoppers were just blown away, like what the heck, you know. But they they got over it <laughs> eventually. Well, that was a big thing that was important to me. I mean, right. to your point, like because I did get you know a benefit of being connected to that genre of yep. Sammy and all these guys that were coming out, and I wanted to sound like that, you know. And, right. and so, I, and, and that's really how I started making music was to sound like that. But also, I was doing the rap thing too. Once right. I got a little bit of a fan base, it was important to me to establish that I really can compete at that level with some of the top people just in hip hop in general, lyrically, yep. and try and establish Absolutely. myself there. Cause I just knew that I, I felt like I had the talent to do that maybe more so than some of the other guys. And so, you know, when I did, you know, some of the tapes that, that you did and, and yep. any opportunity that I had to really rap, you know, making a song with Slain and yep. Maddie connected me and Slain, like, Yep. I wanted to build that credibility because it was important to me because I really did grow up listening to that type of stuff, you know, yeah, uh, absolutely. Like growing up listening to Army of the Pharaohs and, you know, some <laughs> of the real East Coast, like classic yeah. stuff. Um, but I also knew that, like, you know, that's not exactly where I live in terms of my music and everything. But I think 
that's what's cool about music now is, is that you can kind of show a couple sides to yourself. You know, you can show that lyrical side, you can make more poppy stuff. And if you establish like I can do this, then people are maybe more open to hearing more unique kind of stuff. And I think that this era is important because it is, it, it's a, it was a new thing. Like I can tell you the decade before this took off, you know, you guys all took off was, it was, you know, you were either in the scene or you were out. So you either did a particular, you would go do shows and you could do that to particular style of hip hop. And if it didn't work, you were kind of screwed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you were stuck in yeah. an area. That's why people had to move to areas. Like you had to move to LA or you moved to Minnesota or move down South. You had to move to areas where your music was, where people listen to your music. It's not like that now. Now we have uh, with, you know, all the technology, we, anyone can make any type of music anywhere and still have a fan base. And, you know, I think that was another big, threw people off is like, you know, here's this new style in Boston and we don't know what to do with it, you know? And, um, but do you find that you're singing songs or your more popular songs? You know, I remember funny, we had this, we had this conversation once you we were like, those are still some of my most popular songs. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I, you know, when I look at the, the biggest songs that I have, some of them are a little bit more melodic, but mm -hmm. the absolute biggest song that I, that I have is my song better days, which, has a melodic hook, but that's a hip hop song. That's you fairly know, that's new, right? Or is that old? No, that's old. That's from, okay. you know, that's from 2013. Okay, and, I'm thinking of something else. And um, Rolling Stone is my new song. And that kind of has that that vibe too, where it's, you know, I mean, one of my big, it's funny because you said Minnesota, one of my biggest influences musically, you know, always has been kind of that whole atmosphere, rhyme yep. sayer vibe. And I think right. those guys do do a unique um, kind of melodic rap thing too. Yep. They'll have kind of melodic hooks. It's not necessarily poppy, but it's melodic. And my song Better Days, I felt like kind of had that vibe. And that was by far my biggest song. And I think that's just because the message of that song and the lyrics of that song were so authentic that people gravitated towards it. Um, yep. But it wasn't necessarily like the most catchy poppy thing. So, you know, funny enough, the things that have brought me the most success in terms of songs have been the, the songs that are authentic. Lyrically, I'm telling a real story. Um, and it's, you know, just something that, that really means something to me. And mm -hmm. when you're making so much music, you're not always gonna achieve that. Yep. And so sometimes I'll make music and it's just fun and I'm smoking weed, talking about, you know, partying, whatever, and it's a fun song and that might be a pretty cool song. And it's only every once in a while that you really are feeling something or you're going through something and you write about it. Like I wrote my song Rolling Stone about when my dad passed away. And I felt like I hadn't really made a song like that in a long time because I just wasn't mentally in that place. When I was mm. younger, you know, I, I, I just felt things more. I mean, you know, when you're young, you know, 19, 20 years old, you're just kind of more emotional and you're feeling stuff. And so I wrote a lot of music back then that was kind of along those lines. I think people really gravitated towards it because it was authentic and just, you know, it was, it was me. And then I started making more and more music that was just kind of more lifestyle stuff. And my life at the time felt pretty good. I was having a good time. I was in my twenties living life, you know, just, you know, just partying, living in LA, whatever, and writing music that reflected that. And I think people love that music too, but this new song, Rolling Stone, kind of got me back to my roots a little bit in terms of really being connected with my emotions. What am I feeling and trying to, talk authentically about that and right. so i've always noticed that the stuff that does the best is is that that type of stuff that is really a moment in time and is really authentic to what's going on in your life right then and now and doesn't necessarily need to be the most catchy singy hook but just something that's got some substance to it and some mel melody for the hook that you can kind of remember uh but you're not overdoing it right I totally agree. I think that's what makes, you know, each artist unique is when they come with their own perspective and their own authenticity and something that is genuine that makes them different from the next person. And I feel like that connects and that brings something fresh. Right. Um, I do want to go back. I know, you know, I know you probably don't like to talk about it too much, but I do want to go back to the label deal because people are interested. Yeah. No, I'll talk about it, man. You, you know, know, I just watched the podcast. <laughs> I know you weren't really happy so about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll talk to you about like man. Crazy about how that went down. But, um, you know, I just want to talk about because we're transitioning from the success of the frat, the let's just say the frat rap era, whatever. It, it's just hip hop era, but um, you're coming out of that, and then you're able to get a deal. 
in a short period of time uh, from 1993 is out for how long before you get this? Uh, so a couple of years, maybe tops. Not even, not even, right. it was even quicker than that. The deal took, you know, probably about a year from start to finish to actually close. But from when I actually started the conversations, it was only like a month after that mixtape came out. Cause what happened was, you know, I was building my fan base slowly doing shows with you in Boston, you oh. know, I sold 150 tickets to that Chris Webby show. Yes, it was did. like the best <laughs> night of my life. You know, it was fucking awesome. And I was really starting to just kind of go somewhere and connected with Maddie. started working on this bigger project, 1993. It was really going to be like my debut kind of mixtape, I felt. Yep. And I put that out. That, you mentioned the blog era. That was yep. really such a huge thing at the time. And so right. good music all day bro bible those were the two blogs that were really supporting that whole you know I'm, I'm fine calling it the frat rap era because you know looking back i mean it's it's it's, it's just awesome you know I'm, I'm grateful for where i'm at and you know that was a fun right. moment in time yeah, um, and so you know th those two blogs were, were really supporting that whole movement of music and so both of them sponsored the 1993 mixtape and they posted it on their blogs and they had hundreds of thousands of readers a month at the time. Yep. And so that drove a ton of traffic to the mixtape on Dat Pip. And right. so when I put that mixtape out on Dat Pip, I was 17 years old. I was a senior in high school. I released that shit in the library trying to use the Wi-Fi to get it on Dat Pip. <laughs> like, these are all like, you know, and then I was, you know, going into the city at night, you know, trying to open up on a show, you know, with you. And yep. so the the dat piff thing happened and i got put on the top page of dat piff because there got there were so many downloads in the first day there was like six thousand downloads in the first day and because there was so much traffic coming to it from those blogs and so um atlantic records basically saw that i was on the top page of dat piff you know at the time they were probably sifting through oh who are these artists that are popping up on dat piff let's try and find some new talent and so they reached out to me and i remember i was i was in um some after school thing and i got an email and it was like, you know, Alex at Atlantic Records, like, hey, what's up? So-and-so wants to meet you. You know, he's the vice president at Atlantic Records, wants to fly you out and have a meeting. And I run outside of the class thing that I'm in. I call Maddie. And I'm <laughs> like, yo, like, I just got this email. I don't know what it is. And Maddie had just moved to L.A. Uh, right. to, to work more closely with Sammy and his publishing yep. company. that They were starting yep. out there at the time. And he was like, well, I got this manager that I'm working with out here. Let me call him and see if he can help you out. So then I got connected with Maddie's manager. That guy became my manager at the time. And so he was managing me and Maddie. And we started to build this whole little company. And so I basically graduated high school about a month after that and took the summer to kind of work on some music and be at home for the last time. And then moved out to Los Angeles in September or in September of 20. Uh, 11, I guess it would be. And um, Maddie was out there. We ended up signing the deal um, that year on Halloween. We signed the deal officially and we started working on the first project. And, you know, I, I have a lot of, you know, interesting things to say about kind of the label process at that time because what was happening was labels weren't making money at that time because there was the transition from paid yep. physical distribution to digital distribution, but streaming didn't exist yet. Yeah. That was a iTunes, tough era. Yeah. Was iTunes era. wasn't even really that monetizable yet from yep. the label standpoint. And so, you know, I didn't necessarily have a bad experience with the label as much as being with a label at that time was difficult because you know, that they didn't have a lot of, resources or know what to do in the digital era and so i actually felt a little bit limited because i felt like to really gain traction in this new world because at, at that point it was 2012 2013 it was like to really start to gain more traction you just have to have your finger on the trigger online and be super active all the time and not jump through hoops of saying hey record label can i post this picture can i get this song out on soundcloud can i do this you know, all right, well, let's take six weeks. We got to send it to legal and do this whole thing. It's uh, like, you know, that starts ouch. to slow you down. Is that what it was? They, they wouldn't let you post. They were like, they, they like overlooked your whole marketing, everything. They were trying to figure out how do we market artists in this new world, you know? Right. And 
they just didn't really know. They didn't really know. And the people that did know were the young kids that were right. independent, you right, know? Right, right. And so I kind of saw the writing on the wall, which was, I'm going to have more success. The type of artist that I am, I'm going to have more success if I take this whole business on myself, because that's how I got here. You know what I mean? That's how I was able to meet you in Boston and figure stuff out is just being um, aggressive and being excited about just being entrepreneurial with all of this stuff. Yep. That's what's going to make me succeed. And I'm not Drake. I'm not one of these top artists that need the support of a major label right. um, because, you know, it's just not the, the world that my music lives in. And so I did one album with them uh, and one mixtape. What was and, the name of that album? Lamp City. Lamps, the first Lamp City yep, is, exactly. is the major, is the Atlantic record. Yeah. So that was my debut major label release. Okay. And uh, that did very well um and people loved it and that's you know that's to this day one of my you know best performing projects but um after that there was the option period and i asked to be able to just not go to the next option because it was really honestly what it broke down to for me is like i understand i i, I started to understand the business a lot more at that point and right. i was kind of seeing like all right well you know i might get this little check this little advance to do the next level of the deal but they might not put an album out for three years how mm. am i supposed to live on you know it seems like a lot of money when you're getting the check for you know some big you know five figure number but that, you know when you stretch that out over three years that's you know that's not a lot of money no. and so i kind of started to realize like i can do this on my own and make the money now and not have to go through this whole system and so that's when I basically, I called the guy at the label and I was like, listen, I want to do this on my own. Like, I feel like you gave me, and I still have a good relationship with that guy. He was a mentor uh, for me for a while. And I told him like, you gave me the keys, you know, and you gave me an understanding of the game. This was like an education for me. And I want to take that and run my own business. Right. I don't want to be some artist. I want to be like you, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, Sometimes, you know, that was a tough era. And, you know, I think a lot of times labels at that time were ending. Uh, phone call go. came in. No worries. You there? Yeah. All right, cool. I don't know how to shut off these other things yet. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I think at that time it was like, I think labels were just expecting to just kind of cash in on our work like it was like you create the fire we'll put the gasoline on it um and sometimes there's just a little too much dependency on that you know and if it, and and i'm from the era where like there was a lot of people that got deals that got shelved for years like you're talking about three four years i saw what that did to people's careers yeah yeah and it was devastating it was that some people did not make it back from that you know some people sat you know lost their whole up in buzz because labels would sign people right off the rip like yourself and then shove them until they could get a big single and that was it <laughs> and you would well, sit it there was, it was guys that i came up with a lot a lot of, a lot of guys you know had that exact situation happen yeah. and and then some of them you know went a completely different direction and, and mac miller was a similar kind of guy at the time who did come up in that kind of frat rap era but he yep. just branched out into his own sound and just succeeded so much and became a major label artist. And he is the, uh, the you know, the success story was, was such an incredible artist yep. and, th and that worked for him, but he didn't end up signing a major until five or six years in. Yeah. They, he was doing the whole thing with Rostrum records and everything. Yeah. They had a good team behind that. I heard some stories about right. how they they developed him and stuff like that. And that was a, yeah, he probably, you know, yeah, he definitely probably was the biggest artist to come out of that whole era there. Um, so let's talk about afterwards, right? So now you're done with the, the major label. You move back to Massachusetts to kind of figure it out. Like what's the next move after that? Yeah. So, you know, I kind of had a real soul searching moment at that point when I left the major label system mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of just, and again, you know, I was, I was still pretty young. Um, and I always thought that that was one of the things that gave me a little bit of an advantage. To, Being young? <laughs> well, you, well, cause if you, if you think about that time period, um, where we were all starting to do shows with you, 
I was five or six years younger than any of the other artists. And Which so ones? I was like, like Sammy and all them. Yeah. Like any of those okay. guys, like, you know, they were all college. That's right. They were older. College, and I was still in high school. Right. And so I was That's like, right. let me just pick up game yep. and, you know, try and do this a little slower. Cause I've got, you know, time's on my side. Let me learn. And that's why I wasn't super, you know, one way or another on the whole major label thing. Cause I was like, I'm not going to college. This is like my college education. I can get a crash course on the industry and figure this out. And if it goes well, it goes well. If it doesn't, I've gotten out and I can figure that out. And so, yeah, after I left that um, label situation, I was like, I got to start running this like a real company. I got to start Lamp City Records, run yep. this like a real company and start, you know, getting on point with selling merchandise and, you know, just thinking entrepreneurially about how to grow my brand and getting super engaged on social media and started focusing more on, on Instagram and, and stuff like that. And just slowly built up the fan base brick by brick. And a lot of it was getting people to come into my ecosystem who might have heard the music from the first album and bringing them in as like long term fans. And what I feel like I've built now, you know, in my opinion, and I'm biased, but what I've built, although it might be smaller than some of the biggest artists in the world, to me is so valuable because I've got people who I'm really connected with that are supporting everything that I'm doing. And I think that's a lifelong relationship with people, you know, and as I grow, I think my, my people who follow me and listen to my music and engage with the content that I put out, they're growing too. And I'm constantly able to, you know, just create stuff and, you know, share that with those people that support me. And that's not a flash in the pan situation. That's a lifelong business that I can run and grow right. each year, you know? And so that's the mental shift that I made was let me look at this long term and really build something here like a business. And yeah. And that, that went through a lot of ups and downs, you know? And I was also pretty young, so I was figuring stuff out and figuring my life out also. Yeah. At the same time. yeah. But I started, started doing a lot of tours, getting on the road. And I mean, those are some of the best times in my life is just getting out there, doing shows, meeting fans, you know, really connecting with people. Oh, Sorry, you're I, I back. Phone call too. You're back. You're back. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that was really, uh, the shift that I made. And so I was just kind of hustling in any way that I could to, to build my following brick by brick. And, and now I'm at this point where it's become a really successful thing for me, even though I might not have the biggest name in the game, I own it all, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I want to talk about how it's like the game kind of shifted, like the music styles changed, right? Like now we're now that era, like, let's just keep going with the frat rap era. That's kind of dying down. And now this new era of hip hop is coming in and, and local artists like cousin Stiz and, and Michael Christmas are, are starting to make moves and, and come out. And where did you fit? Uh, where did you musically in your head where at that point, you know, you're still in the game. You're still connected to all those guys. You know, you're, you're friends with those guys. Where are you thinking you're at at that point? Like, especially when the trap era starts taking over, in those type of beats, I should say. Um, where did you go? I mean, that was completely different from really what you had been doing before. But yet, I know that you kind of dabble in that area a little bit. So, like, where? How was that transition? Yeah, I. Uh, you know, I. I think that for me, my music has naturally evolved as as I've evolved, and and mm -hmm. kind of to the point I was talking about earlier, like. Um, it's, it's always been this thing for me with making music. It's like about like what I'm feeling in that moment. Like right. if I'm feeling a certain way in my life, then that's the kind of music that I'm going to make. Um, right. and of course, I think all of us as artists are, um, you know, super influenced by the sound that's happening in that moment, especially an artist like me, who's been doing this for, you know, and it's funny cause I'm not that old, but I've been doing this for 11 years. No, I know. I know. I've seen different you're, you're a veteran. Music. Yeah, I know. Uh, and that's what I'm yeah. saying. That's why I think that this point is like you've got you went from one sound to here's this new sound, you right. know, and it's right. like, what do you do now? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the best thing to do 
if you're an artist who's you know got staying power in that sense that you're just going to continue to make music and continue to do your thing it's like remember that you're not in the business of like what's the trend right now you're in the business of you know what what makes you you so that's the most important i always say like i'm not in the music business i'm in the cam meekins business right and so i think that's first and foremost important is like don't don't shy too far from your roots because that's what got you there but also experiment have fun you know get on new trap beats and do stuff like that because people want to hear that you know and they want to hear your rendition of that after something's become a trend they want right. to hear some guy that they really like get on that trend and see what they can do with that style and that's what mm -hmm. some of the best artists are able to do is they can adapt but not do it in a way that's kind of corny because they're, they're sticking to their roots and they still have that base of music that's like that but you can experiment and try new sounds and stuff like that and so i've always tried to kind of be mindful of that uh, because you know sounds have changed for sure and i think a big thing that actually you know what it boils down to for me is is that i produce a lot of my stuff so the stuff that i produce is always going to sound like me like sound like that kind of classic me, me vibe but yep. then when I'm working with other producers, that's my opportunity to try those newer sounds, try the trends and, and stuff like that. So I think it's about having that balance. Yeah, when, I forgot to bring that up. When did you start um, producing for yourself? Like, when was that? It was hand in hand. I mean, the, the way that I got into music was, was from producing. You know, I was producing um, and, and, and again, I was like, you know, young, like 15, 16, and I was producing for some of my friends at school and then ended up kind of, starting to rap on those songs too right. and my friend joel um he kind of encouraged me to actually get on the track too as opposed to just producing it and that's how it all started and so right. i really started as a producer which i think again was a was a benefit to me because i understood how to structure a song and so when i when i finally took that next level and started working with maddie you know I already had some understanding of like how to make music because I wasn't just writing 16 bar verses, I was creating songs. And so right. once I met Maddie, I was able to really, really make a real song and collaborate with him and talk the talk from a producer standpoint, not mm -hmm. just an artist standpoint. And that was how I created my sound, you know? <laughs> Is are you producing most of your stuff now? Is like fifty fifty? What's the the percentage? Yeah, it's been about fifty fifty for a while. Uh, the Lamp City two album that I dropped last year uh, that was about fifty fifty, um, and you know it, it's always been like, if it's not me, it's people that I'm that I'm close to. I've got like right. two or three you know close people that I'm. Who else are you working with? Like Co Jangles. Um, uh, my boy, Multiple Pete's, he's, he's a, a friend of mine who I grew up with who started producing a few years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I got one with T Watt on the on the latest album, Lil Rich. So it's, you know, guys that 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 all of us all of us are connected through the Boston music scene, really. Are they all Boston? Yeah. Are they all Massachusetts based? Are, are, are yeah, I think so. Pretty oh, much. Cool. I, I think uh, I think um, T Watt's not from Boston, but you know, he, he works with Stiz and, and a lot of guys. And so he's, cool. he's in that circle of people. And so, um, you know, it's it's really just people that you're actually connected with, not just, you know, random beats here and there. Uh, no, no, that's cool. Yeah. You get, you get a better result that way. Right. Um, I also want to, you know, I, I noticed that you're doing a podcast now. I went on your, I went on your Instagram and I saw yeah. nothing but podcasts. Um, yeah. What's the story with that? Yes. Yeah, so what, what is that, the theme of it? Yeah, I started that a couple months ago. Uh, honestly, one of the big things that, that led me to do that was, you know, my dad passed away in September and I've always been wanting to do a podcast. Like it's something that I wanted to do for a while now, but I never just pulled the trigger on it. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, that was, you know, obviously a, a real life changing moment where I just kind of sat with myself and I was like, you know, what, what do I really want to do here? I'm sitting in this house, you know, places are locked down. I'm, I've got more time on my hands. Like I just want to create and I want to, um, connect with with my people even more than just on the music side I want to have something weekly that I can do and even if it's this thing over here that's not necessarily directly connected to my music it's, it's something new that I'm that I'm doing and uh, I think that whole situation kind of just gave me the courage to say well stop thinking about the reasons not to do something and just just do it you know yeah. 
And so I just wanted to be more active. I, I thought that having a podcast was a great way to do that. I think that, you know, I enjoy having long form discussions with people doing stuff like what this is right here. Like I've always enjoyed doing that in my personal life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now I'm just taking that public, I think. And so that was the motivation. And it's just something that I'm excited to be building brick by brick alongside the music. And so, you know, it reminds me of what I was doing back in 2010 when I met you. It's like this new thing that I'm building from scratch because what I've noticed is, is that although there are definitely people, you know, and some people that are watching this right now who are fans of my music and now they're fans of my podcast too, it's really kind of its own thing. Like my music is over here and the podcast is over here. And that's a, the podcast is a new thing that I'm building from scratch, you know, and it's not getting thousands of views every time it's, it's growing from scratch. And that's exciting because that's kind of how I started doing music. And so I know that if I can hit that first milestone and then I can hit the next one and the next one after that. And so I'm excited to build that part of my business too, because it's something that I could see doing for a long, long time alongside my music, honestly. Do you have guests on it? I mean, how, what's the format yeah. out of it? So yeah, I have, do? Guests. I have guests on it. We just do it over Zoom right now because of COVID, yeah. but eventually I'd like to move that to in-person. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's just like hour and a half, two hour long form conversations. Honestly, I'd love to have you on and, and continue this conversation on the podcast Absolutely. because, well, you know, change people, roles. You can yeah. interview me. <laughs> exactly. You know, th those are the type of things I'm doing. It's just, it's just um, open format conversations with interesting people. And it's, and it's not just music. You know, I had the, the Dean of the public health uh, school yeah. at, at Brown university on, you know, and this oh, guy's wow. on, on CNN all the time. And so talking to him about the coronavirus, I had, uh, my friend Matt Negrin, who's the producer for The Daily Show, you know, talk to him about politics and different stuff like that. So I'm just trying to talk about stuff that that I'm interested in, too, you know, and there's music, yep. too. But but it's it's really uh, this this new thing that I'm that I'm excited about. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it seems like people want to hear people talking about stuff. I was watching yeah. um, Seinfeld and uh, he was that coffee, you know, com getting coffee with comedians. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Show is. And he's like, talk and talk and talk. And that's all we just, everyone talks all the time. And now people want to watch everybody talking, talking. It sounds ridiculous. I thought <laughs> about that. I was like, yeah, it does kind of sound ridiculous, but everybody loves it. Yeah, <laughs> it is really crazy. I mean, you know, I certainly see that. And now I've got this podcast and it's like, you're, we're all competing for, for screen time right like you're just scrolling and scrolling and and i've yeah. noticed that you've made that pivot too like you know you're uh doing a lot of great stuff on social media and and i think that's you know i think you're you know one thing that i've always thought is really awesome about you and your business is your ability to adapt to what's going on in the market yeah. you know what i'm saying like yeah. i mean how long have you been doing shows 25 years no not that long uh 17 i think six I, well before corona ended 16 i started in 2004 but i guess like if you counted the intern years and the handing out yeah. flyers at other people's shows in 20 years yeah. yeah so that's what i'm saying but you know so you've seen trends come and go you've seen yeah. artists come and go but you're that's still true. here with your business and i think that's you know if anyone could take anything away from this conversation i feel like it's, it's that you know what i'm saying like yeah. consistency I, I started doing these because, you know, I didn't want to make leads about me. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't want to do that. But people, my, my boy Parker, he was like, you got to put your face out there more, man. He's like, it, it, people aren't going to trust it. They got You got to personalize everything. Totally. So that I was like, all right, then I'll do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But right. it was, I didn't really necessarily want to do it. I never really wanted to host my shows just because it's too much damn work. So it was just like... Uh, but yeah, that was a different era we're in, and, 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 and it's definitely about adapting. I told someone the other day, you know, like if I was if I was booking shows strictly on the music I liked, I you know, would have been out of business 10, 15 years ago, you know, right. and right. it's not really about what I like. It's about what the fans like and who's going to come up, you know, and. Um, well, it's just it's just all about, you know, rolling with, you know, the situation. I've gone through so many phases in my career, you know, you have. <laughs> and. You definitely have. And there are so many different turning points and I can talk about specific ones. Like I've had, you know, I had this moment where I was in the car with, with my manager, Tim LaRue, and we yeah. were outside of Boston University sports facility. And I was talking about giving up, you know, I was talking about like not just, just moving away from music and just doing something else. And I, I think I was just mentally at a certain point at that time. And I didn't end up doing that obviously, but 
that was like a moment where it was like, there's just a choice. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what it's all about when you're, when you're in the music business or you're in some career like this, it's just about rolling with each phase that you're in and knowing that this is a chapter and you're going to have another chapter and that chapter, right. the next chapter might be more successful, might be less successful, right. but that doesn't really matter to your overall success, you know? True. And so that's one thing that I've learned a lot is, is like my first phase I was working with, you know, more of the major label people and, you know, and, and Maddie really gave me so much wisdom to the, to the industry. And, you know, and, and then I had, you know, a manager at the time back then, but then I stopped working with him and then I built up this new management team and Tim started to manage me and it became this whole new phase of my yep. career and, you know, built this real great group of people around me from Tim to Maddie to all these other guys who, who supported me along the way. And then, you know, our lives happen, you know, different things happen to all of us in our life. And so then, you know, the circumstances change even more, but you find ways to adapt and still run your business and, you know, just kind of figure things out. And that's the thing that I'm just so, so grateful for is, is that, you know, for the most part through my whole career, as these phases have changed, those core people around me from Tim to Maddie to, you know, my boy Saeed and multiple Pete's and all these guys have stuck with me to support, you know, what I'm doing. And that support might come in new ways as things change, but we're all still kind of working in that way. And so I think that's what's, you know, what's really, you know, I think that's what gives people staying power is just being open to changing and adapting and not saying I'm going to throw in the towel because I've been doing this for so long and I'm not starting to see the same results as I used to see, you know, it's just, right. Just keep pushing, you know, you never know what that next chapter is. And that's kind of how I feel. Great wisdom, Cam. Um, really appreciate we're, we're going to wrap it up, but I really appreciate you coming through and, and doing this. And it sounds like, you know, you, you got the right down that you're going during these tough times. I'm sorry about your father. I'm really sorry to hear that. And Thanks, um, better days on the rise, my friend. And yes, sir. Um, I've, I've been, I've been where you've been and uh, it, time will heal. So let's stay in touch brother. And uh, good luck with everything out there in uh, California. And, um, We'll talk soon. Absolutely, man. Well, real quick, I just want to shout out to you oh. for putting this together, bro. And I want to shout out to everybody in the comments, too, that, that came in here. Yeah, love. sorry. We, you sorry, know? I couldn't shout everybody out in the comments. No, myself, it's, it's, but... it's all good. It's all good. But I just wanted to say thanks thanks for uh, tuning in to everybody. And, and, and you know, thanks for thanks for uh, giving me that opportunity 10 years ago to do that for Sean show, man. I mean, yeah, yeah, definitely. I and I hope we can do night. another uh, Twas the Night After Christmas event, you know, back at the Middle East. If it Hell opens yeah. Up again. <laughs> Those are always fun. Oh, my God. Yeah, absolutely. We'll make it happen. All right, bro. All right, bro. Peace. <clears throat>